class, and welcome back for another Flex Time Review. Now before we get started with this video, I do have a quick announcement I have to make. We actually have a new co-host who will be joining us for some of our future videos. So how about we get a drum roll introduction. Solid eight days old, her favorite activities are pooping and eating. I want everyone to welcome Kennedy to the team. Kennedy's going to make some guest appearances in several of our videos just to up the cuteness factor a bit. Now, I understand some of you may be thinking, wow. Is this guy really going to exploit his newborn daughter for a couple of YouTube views? Well, you are spot on because that is exactly what I'm doing. But in all seriousness though, this face is just made for the camera. Who wouldn't want to look at that face all day long, huh? huh? I'm sorry you had to witness that. Moving on, the topic of today's review is going to be operant conditioning. Just like our lesson on classical conditioning, this video is going to focus on how you can solve an operant conditioning problem when presented with one. While I will touch upon some of the historical context of operant conditioning, it won't be much. So if you want more of an in-depth history lesson, feel free to go over to my Unit 4 review video. The link will be in the description. As always, just click the link and it will bring you right to the part in the video where I'm talking about the history of operant conditioning. In the description box, you will also find a link that brings you to a worksheet that goes with the video if you'd like to follow along. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Operant conditioning is just going to be a type of learning where a behavior is strengthened when it is reinforced and weakened when it is punished. In our last video, we went over a learning technique known as classical conditioning. Classical conditioning dealt with reflexive behaviors. We're going to see that with operant conditioning, it deals more with voluntary behaviors. To clear this up further, our next video is going to focus on comparing and contrasting the two types of conditioning. So here we go. Influenced by Edward Thorndike's Law of Effect, B.F. Skinner was able to develop learning techniques that resulted in some pretty interesting behaviors. We have pigeons playing ping pong, and even guiding missiles shot out of planes. And I know I said I wouldn't dive too deep into the history aspect, but this story is too good to pass up. Codenamed Project Pigeon was launched during World War II. Skinner went and pitched the idea of pigeon-guided missiles to the U.S. government and was actually given $25,000 in funding. To put that into perspective, that is almost half a million dollars in today's currency, all for pigeon-guided missiles. Now, if you are a pigeon lover, you might want to skip the next part of this video. So basically, the pigeons were going to be placed on the nose cone of a missile, and they were to act as the pilot for the projectile. The system consisted of three lenses where the pigeon was located. When a target was projected on a screen, the pigeons were trained to peck at it with their beaks, sending a signal to the missile to change course. If the missile was on target, the signal would be in between the three screens out of the pigeon's sight. Now, I hate to say it, but unfortunately, yes, pigeons were harmed in the making of this experiment. Aww. But how exactly was Skinner able to get these pigeons to peck at the target in the first place? Well, that's exactly what we're going to find out as we discuss operant conditioning. As I previously mentioned, operant conditioning is going to be a type of learning where a behavior is either strengthened or weakened by the use of reinforcement or punishment. Starting with reinforcement, it's just going to be any event that strengthens a behavior that follows. Pretty simple, right? Well, not so much. Here's where a lot of students start to get confused. So it's very important that you listen up here just to make sure you learn everything properly. So reinforcement can be either positive or negative. When I say positive and negative, I'm not talking positive being good old happy-go-lucky and negative being all bad or sad. We're going to look at positive as application and negative as removal. So let's go back to our original question. How exactly was Skinner able to get the pigeons to guide the missiles? He basically just uses the principles of positive reinforcement to teach the pigeons. Skinner would reward the pigeons with food every time it achieved the desired behavior. Since something is being added to the situation to increase the behavior, we can conclude that this is positive reinforcement. So going back to what I said previously, how exactly did Skinner get the pigeons to complete the desired behavior in the first place? Since Skinner can't speak pigeon, at least I don't think he can, he had to use some type of alternate method. Skinner will use the process of shaping. Shaping is an operant conditioning procedure where reinforcers guide behavior toward closer and closer approximations of a desired goal. As I mentioned earlier, Skinner trained the pigeons to guide the missile by having them peck at the target on the screen. So Skinner just dropped the pigeon in the apparatus and will provide it with some type of positive reinforcement, such as bird food. The pigeons walk towards the screen, Skinner gives them food. The pigeon accidentally touched the screen with its beak, Skinner gives it food. From doing this multiple times and continuously providing reinforcement, the pigeons eventually learned to peck at the target when on the screen, which in turn helped guide the missile. Well, what if Skinner wanted to use negative reinforcement to train this behavior in a pigeon? 
With negative reinforcement, a behavior results in the removal or avoidance of a punishing or aversive stimuli, which in turn increases the likelihood of the behavior to be repeated. Let's say that inside of the apparatus, the temperature is set to a very cold level. Skinner observes the pigeon closely, and every time it pushes its beak up against the screen, he raises the temperature a little bit. This would relieve the pigeon of the aversive stimulus of coldness, making them more likely to repeat the desired behavior. Now that we've talked about reinforcement, let's talk about punishment. While the goal of reinforcement is to increase the likelihood of a behavior to repeat itself, punishment will do the opposite and decrease the chance of the behavior will be repeated. Now oftentimes people will confuse punishment with negative reinforcement. But remember, these are two completely different learning processes that give us two different results. Punishment by application, or positive punishment, refers to a situation where a behavior is followed by the addition of an aversive stimulus. Let's say Billy is a bit of a class clown and always interrupts the teacher during her lecture. The teacher, having enough of Billy's shenanigans, decides to give Billy extra homework. Now this would be considered positive punishment because something aversive was added in order to stop Billy from misbehaving in the future. Well, let's say this works for a little, but after a few weeks go by, Billy starts to act out in class again. This time, his teacher tries something different and takes Billy's phone away. So in this situation, something was taken away from Billy that he liked in order for him to stop misbehaving. This is referred to as negative punishment. With negative punishment, we see the removal of a reinforcing stimulus in order to stop an undesirable behavior from repeating itself. For the most part, psychologists do believe that reinforcement is superior to punishment in teaching proper behavior. Punishment can still be effective when it is used immediately and it is consistent. However, even when punishment successfully stops a behavior from reoccurring, there are still some drawbacks. Now, punishment does work at stopping an undesirable behavior from repeating itself, but it doesn't necessarily model proper behavior. So the individual is going to know what they did wrong, but they're not necessarily going to know how to fix the behavior. Punishment that is too intense can lead to fear, passiveness, anxiety, and hostility. And not to mention, and I know I am guilty of this when I was growing up, Whenever my mom and dad punished me for something, I would just make sure that I didn't get caught the next time I did it. You better not get any ideas, my little munchkin. So those are your basics for operant conditioning. However, there's still going to be a few things I would like to talk to you about before moving on to the practice problems. Reinforcers used in classical conditioning can be either primary reinforcers or conditioned reinforcers. A primary reinforcer is going to be any type of reinforcement that satisfies a biological need. These are things such as eating food, or being relieved of some type of pain, such as a headache, are all considered to be primary reinforcers. Conditioned or secondary reinforcers is going to be any stimuli that gains some type of reinforcement through its association with the primary reinforcer. So when Skinner was training pigeons to guide missiles, he was able to associate the food with the projected target on the screen. Now, since the lights are going to be associated with the food, they are going to be considered conditioned reinforcers. Just like with classical conditioning, Operant conditioning will also have stimulus generalization, stimulus discrimination, extinction, and recovery. If you need a reminder of what those terms mean, I talk about them in our last flex time video on classical conditioning, and I also talk about them for a little bit in our unit 4 review video. Reinforcement can also be continuous or partial. Continuous reinforcement is where a reinforcer is provided after each correct behavior. Partial or intermittent reinforcement is where a reinforcer is only given part of the time which is used to cut back on extinction. Again, I go into more detail about reinforcement schedules in the Unit 4 review video. And who knows, maybe one day we'll have a flex time video dedicated all to reinforcement schedules. So there are the basics of operant conditioning. I think we're ready for some practice problems now. Here we go. Daddy, come here, boy. Good boy. Shit. Paul. There's that noise again. Did you hear it? All right. I'm going to lose my mind. Two hours later. Come, Kenny. 
sweet baby. Come here, you. Wanna go watch the office? Let's go. All right, there you have it. Opera conditioning. Little Kennedy just wanted me to tell you guys that if you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like and subscribe. It's always appreciated, and it will keep you up to date on my most recent videos. Anyways, this one's starting to smell a little funky, so I'm out. Peace.